Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Who are you in Messiah Yeshua? That is, if you have a relationship by means of a covenant with the one called Jesus of Nazareth, who are you? What does that do for your personhood? Who you become? Well, we're going to be looking today at a very important scripture that defines for us who we are in Messiah. And it's not the name, but rather it's the behavior. Realize that although we're saved by grace and not of works, it's a free gift. Having been saved by the grace of God, that we access through faith, biblically grounded faith, we become a new creation in Messiah, and we are created for good works. That is, deeds which are keeping in character with God, walking, manifesting His glory, doing His will. And we're going to be looking at a very familiar passage, as most of you know, we are in the midst of our study of Yeshua's Sermon on the Mount, that great preaching that He gave nearly 2,000 years ago. And notice what He says as we take out our Bible and look to Matthew chapter 5. Remember these words that He said concerning you and me, how He sees us, what He calls us, and what these terms imply for us and our behavior. So look to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Notice what he says, and it's a declarative statement. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, what does that mean? For many people in the West, they think of salt as a, a seasoning. We talk about salt kind of as the zeal of life. But biblically, within this context, in many things are lost in translation because we don't understand the origin of that word. We don't understand the culture identifying of that word and its relevance. Salt in the Middle East, salt in that time, was not so much a, a seasoning. Rather, it was that which was used for preserving something. And not just preserving within the Jewish context, it has another important meaning. We know the scripture says, do not eat blood. Blood has a very significant place within scriptural revelation. We know that says in Leviticus that there's life in the blood. And when that Jerusalem council got together, and set forth some principles about sharing the faith, bringing Gentiles to faith in that gospel message. One of the things that James says is that he does not permit eating of blood. Now, what was done was that salt was used after that, that animal was slaughtered. He was killed in a way that blood would be drained from his, his body, but not all the body. And that's why when, when meat, when it's butchered and prepared for being cooked before it's cooked, it goes through a process known as salting. And what does that salt do? Salt has, and we'll see the significance of this in a moment, salt has the power to draw the blood out of that piece of meat. And why is that important? Here's the key. Blood, not only is it related to life, but it's also blood. What happens when someone's sick? The first thing they do is check the blood. 
because blood contains the contaminants those things that are unclean impure unhealthy disease all of that so when it says here you are the salt of the earth it is not saying you are the zeal of the world no he's saying here you have a call and what is that call in the same way that salt has a power and remember this salt has a power to pull blood out of the meat we're supposed to he says you're the salt of the earth it means here that we have been anointed by means of our faith in Messiah Yeshua believing in this one Jesus Christ for our salvation we are anointed with the Holy Spirit we have every provision that we need to serve God and one of the ways we serve God is by being a force against evil against those things which are spiritually impure those things are displeasing to God we're supposed to pull them out that's what he means look again at verse 13 that's what he means when he says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt now most scriptures say will lose its taste but it's a word for not functioning properly it has nothing to do if you do a good study of this word it has nothing to do with with taste how something tastes when you put it in the mouth this is someone interpreting it based upon western culture no if you do a good study of this word it is the same it's a verb but if you look at the same word in the noun form it is a word for a fool now we wouldn't say if salt becomes foolish but what's a fool when when you understand the origin of this word in the biblical language in greek it speaks about one that does not function properly a fool someone who does not behave according to the normal the accepted order someone that does not fulfill what he's supposed to do so if salt becomes foolish what that means is if salt doesn't function properly it says how will it be made salt that that power of salt the authority of salt what salt we talked about does has that power to pull out blood if it loses that if it doesn't have that anymore can you make it can you restore that and he's saying no in this example he says for it is not powerful that's the word if you look at this next word it is it is not powerful it's the word that has to do with having the ability to accomplish and therefore because it doesn't have the ability to accomplish what what salt was used for placing upon meat drawing out that blood that impurity those things that corrupt and preserving it for a period of time if it loses that power he says very clearly therefore it's not good any longer and it must be cast out this is what it's for now it's no good except for being cast outside and it's going to be trampled on by man so it's a rejection so if we are not uh, following through with what God tells us to do if we're not walking in obedience if we're not committed to the purposes of God God is going to set us aside and we're going to find ourselves when we're not in God's will doing his will what's going to happen trampled we are going to be overcome by the world now it's not a context of salvation it's a context of walking in the anointing and when we're not we become vulnerable to the things of this world so we read look again at verse 13 he says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt doesn't function properly it does not do its role it is not capable of accomplishing what salt does he says uh, and what would be made salt again for it has no power except meaning no usefulness except being cast outside and being trampled on by by man verse 14. now he reveals to us another characteristic for believers not only are we salt that is not only are we supposed to go to war against those things that are impure 
those things that bring about spiritual decay, those things that are against the purposes and plans of God. He also says here, verse 14, you are the light of the world. And light, of course, it's for illumination. We're supposed to be individuals that gives illumination, that is teaching, the revealing of truth to other individuals. So he says, you are the light of the world. And he gives an example. He says, not able a city. Now we would say a city is not able to be hidden upon a mountain, that city which lies upon a mountain or set upon a mountain. Nor, verse 15, nor do they light a menorah. Now this is a, a lamp. They do not light a lamp and set it under a basket in order to teach us something. God has not lit us by means of His Holy Spirit, giving us this power, giving us this call to be the light of the world in order that that light is concealed. He didn't do that in order to put us under a basket. No, He wants us to be like that mountain which is set on a hill. And by the way, hill or mountain has a degree of authority when we look at this prophetically. That means when we look at how that term mountains and hills are used prophetically in the scripture by the prophets, we see that they are related to government, that is, they're related to authority. So God says, I've given you my truth, you have the illumination of the kingdom of God, and therefore I have placed you on that mountain. I have given you authority. He does not want us to be covered up by some basket. But what does he say? They don't do that. They don't put it under a basket, but upon a lamp stand. That is, they take that lamp and they put it upon a stand, which is perfectly designed for holding that light. Now, here's what's interesting. You know that I love the book of Revelation. And we see in those seven messages to those seven congregations, churches in Asian Minor, you know what we see? We see that each church is, is called a lampstand. This is important because it tells us that we have been given light, God's truth, His illumination, and it's the church, the congregation of the redeemed, you and I. They're supposed to be the ones who are manifesting that truth. That's what he says. So they don't put it under a basket, but rather, he says, they place it upon a lampstand, and it gives light to all those in the house. Now, house, one of the ways that that's understood by the sages of Judaism is by it relates to the house of Israel, God's people. And this is telling us very clearly that we're supposed to have a call, a ministry to Israel. Any congregation that does not in some way reach out to the Jewish people, remember what the scripture says, speaks about the power of the gospel. I'm speaking about Romans chapter 1 verse 16. It says the gospel, it is power. It is power to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And what does that mean? There's a priority in order to share that message of truth, that gospel, that power to save, first and foremost, with the Jewish community because of the call that Israel has, that kingdom call. So we read, look again. He says, they do not light a lamp and set it under a basket, but upon a lampstand in order that it lights up all the house. Then he says, thus, verse 16, it's a commandment. Thusly, let your light shine before men in order that they should see, here's the key, your good works. Once more, we are not saved by our good works, but rather having been saved, being that light of the world. If we're going to show truth, we need to show it by our behavior, by our deeds. We talked a few minutes ago about Revelation chapter 2 and 3. 
where he speaks to those seven congregations and calls them his lampstand, the church. But realize something else. He says to so many of those, he says, I know your works. And he evaluates what Messiah says to these leaders of each of these congregations to share with the whole congregation. He says to each, I know your works. So works are important. They're not for salvation, but having been saved, they are the natural, the supernatural outcome of a salvation experience. So we read, let your light be shining before men, thus that they shall see your good works and do what? And glorify your Father, the one in heaven. Now, notice this glorifying of God the Father, that is a description of worship. So here's what he's saying. When I live an obedient life, when my life reflects the call, the purposes of God, when I am behaving, doing that fruit, having good fruit, good works, it is going to lead others to be brought before God for the purpose of glorifying God worshiping him there is that inherent relationship between good works and worship so good works are not for salvation but they bring people to give thanks to give glory to that one true God verse 17 now we're talking about uh, salt that power and we're talking about light that revelation speaking about doing good works and notice how the scripture unfolds it's so vital that we pay attention to how one subject leads into another and now we're ready for verse 17 and this is a passage that in my estimation that the church really needs to study and hear what Yeshua is saying verse 17 he says do not think and here's the problem there's many people that have wrong way of thinking now I'm not saying that they're not saved that they're not nice people that they're not sincere in their faith but they have believed things that are not biblically sound and they've heard them over and over from a variety of different sources within Christianity and because of that they have a wrong way of thinking and this is exactly what Yeshua is dealing with he's telling them you're not thinking properly you're not understanding who I am and what I have come to do you've got it wrong so he says verse 17 do not think and this word for think is not the normal one it's a word of perception do not have this perception do not perceive things in this way it's a word that is emphasized greater than just you know bowling thumping over in your mind thinking about it briefly it has to do with great consideration to something. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Notice how these two things go together, the law and the prophets. And usually when we speak of the law and the prophets, we're speaking about what we call the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And what he's saying here is, do not think that I've come to get away from that put that aside and that's why it's so dangerous today when people say you know the Old Testament is not the go-to source for behavior for believers today someone that says that they may be a nice individual they might truly love the Lord but they're confused spiritually because at the time of the early church yes they were beginning to receive epistles from from paul and other individuals but when messiah was teaching this there was no new testament there was no epistles there were no new testament scripture so when he says law and the prophets he's speaking about what we refer to as the old testament and what's he saying do not have the mindset that i and my coming and my work in any way limits the significance of that he says I did not come to abolish or destroy but to fulfill and this fulfillment 
does not mean that the Old Testament loses uh, relevance, that we don't need to study it and we don't need to apply its truth to our life. He says fulfill it, meaning this. Yes, he comes to fulfill prophecy, but he's come that we might fulfill the truth of the word of God. And notice why I say this, verse 18. For truly I say to you, until the heaven and the earth shall pass away. Now just stop there for a moment. The heaven and the earth, this creation, whenever we're talking about things that sometimes are lost in translation when we do not know the cultural backgrounds. So when the terms heaven and earth appear, we're talking about creation. So he says something, until heaven and earth, until this first creation pass away, and by the way, it will. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, a second creation. And what is that? The kingdom of God. Ultimately, the new Jerusalem. And it is what John says, it is all new. It is a new creation detached from anything in the past. And that's why it is so problematic when people talk about heaven. Heaven of today is not going to exist for eternity the heaven where messiah is at the right hand of god right now those who have died in the faith their souls are there with him there's those elders and the angelic hosts and those four creatures all of that where they are now they're going to leave that they're ultimately and eternally going to be in the new jerusalem so that's why he says very carefully for truly i say to you until the heaven and the earth pass away and iota and that's what it is in greek but it's the word for the smallest hebrew letter a yud and one uh, uh another word has to do with a a part of a letter how they would would write it to give it kind of a a flair to it so we say in english not one jot or tittle but it's not one yud or one breaststroke is what he's saying here. But will by any means pass away from the law until, notice what he says, until all shall be. Now I want you to think about this for a moment because this is an important statement that Messiah is saying. The context is that he is teaching us about kingdom truth. That's heaven and earth passing away and a new heaven and earth called the new Jerusalem that's not a interpretation that's what the book of Revelation says there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth called the new Jerusalem and until that comes the Torah and the prophets have great relevance for us how do we know that well he says until all shall be what does he mean all shall be he's talking about all the blessings, all the promises of God, they're coming in that kingdom experience. So he says, therefore, one who breaks, breaks one of this least of these commandments and teaches one thus to do, meaning one who teaches people to do so, this one shall be called least in the kingdom of God. Now, did you hear that? Here's someone who's breaking the law, the commandments of God, and teaching others to do it as well. But they shall be what? Least in the kingdom of God. Why least? Our salvation is not based upon the commandments. The Torah does not, does not make salvation. It's not an instrument that can cause salvation for a person. That's not the role of the Torah. So a person can be saved but confused. They can be teaching people, these don't have any relevance anymore. You ought not to do that. You can break them. That's fine. There's no more truth to them. Well, that's wrong, but it's not a salvation issue. These people are confused, but they'll be least in the kingdom of God. Look now to the second part of verse 19. But he says, in contrast to that, but who does, meaning does these commandments, and teaches thus shall be what one who does the commandments 
and teaches other people that they should do them as well, they shall be great, called great, in the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice that, that dichotomy. Those who do the commandments, what commandments? There's no other way that you can have a different understanding. He's talking about the law, the Old Testament commandments. And those who apply them to our life under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and teaches others to do the same, that one, Messiah says, will be called great in the kingdom of God. And that's why it's so problematic when we ignore the commandments or say when Messiah speaks about the commandments, he's not speaking about the Old Testament commandments, he's talking about new commandments, and that's all. No, those new commandments, Testament commandments, weren't even given at this time. Verse, verse 20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that, passes over the scribes and the Pharisees, he says, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, what does he mean by that? A very important statement. Unless our righteousness surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Once more, what's he telling, telling us? He's teaching us, instructing us. These Pharisees and scribes, they were all about deeds, good deeds, works. And they were highly committed. But notice what it says. Unless your righteousness exceeds them, well, they were obsessed with good deeds. How will my righteousness exceed them? Very clearly. If your righteousness is not based upon human deeds, but the work, the sufficiency of Messiah, what he did upon that cross, it's only the righteousness. And remember what we've said many times. Messiah was on that cross, and what happened? Our sins, the sins of the world, were placed upon Him. And as our sins were transferred to Him, those who receive His work, as the only means of salvation, the only means of redemption, when we say yes to the cross, what happens? In the same way that our sins were transferred upon Him, His righteousness, the one who knew not sin, never sin, perfect, Messiah's righteousness is imputed to us. And that's how and the only way that one's righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. If our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, only through Him and His righteousness will we be received into the kingdom of heaven. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.